Hi everybody and welcome to another episode of Baggage Claim. I'm Katrina. I'm Julia and this is a show about living with mental health in today's society. And I'm Mel and we're here every Tuesday at 8 p.m. And we'd like to remind you that we are not mental health professionals. We are mental health patients. And if you need help or need to reach out to someone or if something we're speaking about makes you feel a little triggered, don't be afraid to step away or give a call to the description box phone number. Wonderful. Thank you, Mel. Um, Tonight, we are going to be talking about self-advocacy in mental health and how we can take control of it. And tonight we have a special treat for you. We have a very special guest, a man who has a lot of experience in the area of uh, patient advocacy, a man who's also my father, Dennis Kebble. And Dennis, hello. And we want to thank you for joining us on Baggage Claim, only our third guest, one of our most important guests. And Uh, we would love for you to just go ahead and introduce yourself to our friends and family out here in the Baggage Claim universe. Okay. And tell us what brought you to advocacy. What brought you there? All right. Um, I will try to do that as quickly as possible so we can get into the actual um, good stuff about advocacy. So I probably, and I was talking about this with Julia earlier uh, today, um, I got my intense trial by fire in advocacy uh, back in 2007, working for when my uh, 96 year old uncle needed someone to care for him and help him out of a bad situation uh, regarding health care. And I basically ended up uh, traveling up to Southern Illinois and taking care of him for the last five months of his life, basically 24 hours a day. And uh, during that time, uh, found that much of the uh, lessons that I had learned uh, during a 35 plus year of uh, uh, career in investment advisory services uh, applied to advocacy. Um, in my career, I was trying to, always trying to achieve the best outcome for my client and the same thing here regarding patient care and found that there were a lot of lessons that I had learned about working with people and uh, trying to get positive outcomes that uh, that uh, transferred over. And so that that actually is um, what brought me the, the quote that I think was on the banner here, uh, he who holds or whoever holds uh, the clipboard. I don't know if you wanted me to start with that, but that might be, uh, that that's kind of one of my very first lessons in advo- advocacy and it's probably something that in sharing with you is is something that would be most applicable to you on a appointment by appointment basis. I think that's a good right. idea because yeah. uh, we we did get a little bit into the talking about it, and I definitely want folks to hear some of the stuff that Dennis <laughs> told us in the off times when we were getting uh, to know him a little bit about. Well, you guys know him a little better than I do. I'm the third man here, so. Your background is not necessarily in advocacy, but you transitioned into advocacy. Is that sort of right? And um, and so uh, and I think what much of what's applicable is that uh, is healthcare surrogacy. So uh, when that's yeah. you know legally that's what you are when you are acting as a surrogate for someone else. Uh, the state of Florida, like most other states, has specific bar-approved um, documents that allow you to function as a healthcare surrogate, um, with or without power of attorney. And um, after what I did for my uncle back in 2007, um, and in you know my clients knew that I was uh, gone for five months. Um, and many of my clients I had worked with in planning or moving them into retirement um, over the course of 20, 30 years, and many of them had, in retirement, had then moved into uh, various uh, healthcare situations or or facilities or had ex- experience, whether it's with polypharmacy um, or, or early stages of dementia. Um, that 
that ended up with me becoming a healthcare surrogate for a number of first family members and then some friends and then even some uh, clients in certain situations. Uh, that, so you were so good at planning their retirement that they wanted you to help them make life decisions. Well, <laughs> so tell yeah, us about the that, clipboard because the yeah, clipboard, we'll talk about the clipboard. Oh, yeah. okay. That it's I love this story. So go ahead and give this. Tell us about the clipboard situation. Okay, he so, who holds the clipboard. All right. So it. I've I've already told you. Um, and, and again, I'm going to try to go through this fast so that we can actually get to the good stuff Just here. Talk. But you're good but, talk. Uh, um, back in my days as an investment advisor, I worked with a company uh, at that time, the, the second biggest uh, in the country, E.F. Hutton. Now, unless you're 50 years or older, you probably have never heard of it. But, um, but uh, I had uh, most of my work was working with uh, retirement plans and business owned retirement plans. And uh, one of my best friends and associates in North Carolina, he and I were doing most of the business in the entire region, and we were acting as both regional and national consultants. But he did most of his work at, with doctors groups. And I started trying to do that and, and really found very little success with it. Um, I, I just seemed to be approaching them like business people where I uh, had great rapport and it just, uh, it didn't seem to be transferable. And I asked my good friend, Tommy, uh, what his secret was. And uh, he said uh, very succinctly, um, with a great deal of Southern charm, uh, he who holds the clipboard controls the meeting. And now we might say he or she who holds the clipboard, or we might say whoever is closing, holding the clipboard mm -hmm. controls the meeting. And he went into what does the doctor do? What does he spend all day, every day doing? Walking in with his clipboard and everyone is responding to whatever he's looking at. In fact, most of the time he's in the appointment with you, he's not looking at you. He's looking at his clipboard. And uh, he said, you know, ironically, they train themselves to and everyone else in all, all other staff are trained to respond to the doctor with the clipboard. And so he literally would walk into a business meetings wearing a lab coat and holding a clipboard. And, uh, and that's what he attributed his success to. So I decided in advocacy that uh, there was a lot of carryover there and that I could walk in symbolically holding a clipboard and accomplish much of the same thing that Tommy was doing decades earlier with his doctor groups. And so when I go, and this is where I feel now, uh, even though my work has been as a surrogate, this is something that anyone can do to improve, to really kind of orchestrate the outcomes that they're working toward and, and find, in my opinion, a lot more success getting there. So I walk in with a file folder or a manila folder um, and I've got paperwork that I have sent to the office already. So, um, and we can talk a little bit at some point too about what you might, it, it, the more time you can spend before you get to an office and the more documents and doctor's records you can send there, all the better because you're interacting with the front office, you're interacting with the nurses and you're getting the feel for the office. This is especially true if it's a first time, maybe you've been to a number of offices, you've recently had some kind of setback and you feel like you need something new and you're trying to go to a a new doctor's office for the first time. You don't know anyone, you don't know the doctor, but you've been referred there. And so you start off by sending this, this paperwork. You ask that it be attached to the file. It usually isn't. Um, so then you walk in with it, prepared to hand it to them. And uh, then the doctor pretty predictably walks in and says, so why are you here? <laughs> 
<laughs> which oh, can be. You're so right. No, this is a, absolutely one of the things that I would say. I love the the idea, and I think that we should real quick throw a flag up on the fact that before you even start, before you call a mental health professional, before you call a hospital, before you get going on that thing, you have to have those a list, a piece of paper to send them. It's sort of that pre-preparation before you even pick up a phone. So I think it's really important that you know already, and I want you to continue on that vein, but I think it's really important that people understand the very first thing you said is, even before the appointment. And that's super, super important. So you come in with your manila folder and you've already sent it and he's looking at you and what, what, what brings you in today? Right, and, and <laughs> how often time. haven't you all experienced, in, in fact, it's, it's a rare experience when, when he doesn't walk, he or she doesn't walk in saying, so why are you here today? Yep. He's exactly and right. oftentimes they're saying that while they're looking at the clipboard trying to get your name right and they know nothing else about you. Even though they've asked you to fill out their forms, twice, most of which exactly. only you know are not directly applicable, may not be directly applicable to why you're there and it doesn't solicit the information like your whole um, prescription history, which might be vital to them, your diagnosis history. Yep which might be vital to them. They don't ask those questions. Um, and I, so, I, you know, I had an experience with this and I, you know, I didn't realize how important the paperwork was um, and your, your trout, your history, right? Like all of your medical history was until later on in life. And I think that was the one thing that really, you know, kicked me in the butt a little bit. Um, but once you have everything and you can walk up to a doctor and say, look at, this is what I've taken this is what I'm diagnosed with, like, start there, you're, you're jumping through hoops, right? Like, you're, you're showing them that you've been there, done that, and you're ready to, like, move on to the next step. You're not just some patient sitting in there to maybe, maybe you, pay attention to their right, advice. You're, you're prepared, right. and you're, yeah. like, ready. Yeah, yeah, and they know that at that point. And a lot of people, and especially I ran into this with a lot of elderly clients and, and friends and people who had asked me to, to be a surrogate in one form or another for them. A lot of people will walk in with their whole file, but it often remains unopened because they're only there in case somebody has asked them something and they want. So unless the doctor is asking them for information, they're going to pull out something. But otherwise, it stays there unopened. And the whole point of walking in with your file folder is because you want to give them something and you probably will need to because even though you've given it to them already through the office, you faxed it in, you asked that it be attached to your chart, it usually isn't. And I try not to get upset about that. I try not to get upset. In fact, this is where this goes into the next thing where you start off apologizing um, either on the phone or in person. But um, when the doctor says, so why are you here? You can very positively, especially if you're getting good vibes, it's like, okay, it's rare that they have it already, even if you've asked them, but if you're getting good vibes that these are people who care and, and you've been referred for good reason, then you want to keep it upbeat. And so you might just, uh, say, well, let's jump into it. You know, as as you know from the paperwork that we sent in, um, I'm here to find out what you think of the fact that I've been diagnosed both as at various times as, as bipolar one or bipolar two, and that sometimes uh, with a personality disorder, all of which involve might involve either no uh, drugs or different drugs. And uh, can we kind of get in the big picture and, and tell me what your interpretation is? Well, he's going to have no interpretation if he hasn't seen it all, if he hasn't looked at it all. So you're hoping that he has, and believe me, the best places do. So let me give you an example. Um, Julia had the good fortune of going to the Mayo Clinic, and uh, for anyone listening, um, you know, I am Julia's healthcare surrogate, uh, her power of attorney, as well as her father. And, um, and we've talked about this before we started talking and thought that it would be most helpful for anyone listening to 
to uh, talk about many of our most meaningful experiences together and how how this is all impacted. Um, so we went to the Mayo Clinic together in January up in Rochester, Minnesota, and um, they do ask for all the records. So literally hundreds of pages were faxed in uh, to me, and then I had to glean. They were asking for more, no more than 30 pages, but again, it was all 30 pages of notes. And so I had to go through a couple of hundred pages of, of five years of history with every doctor and every facility, and then pare that down to 30 pages that I faxed in, but then pare that down to a six-page letter. Um, and it started off with an introduction of who I was and what I was there doing for Julia, and then uh, I summarized in five remaining pages the last five years and provided healthcare providers, diagnoses, medications, dates of treatment, and all contact records. So all of that was given to them in outline form with big headings, and, um, and that gave them a whole lot of information, all in chronological order, multiple diagnoses, and you can see, for instance, over the course of five years where Julia was being diagnosed as bipolar 2, bipolar 2, bipolar 2, all of a sudden bipolar 1, um, and getting medication, some of which worked and didn't, being sent off to a hospital at one time and being put on, on, uh, anti on uh, antidepressants when she shouldn't have been, and me as power of attorney and healthcare surrogate having to uh, to interrupt that and say, I'm asking that she not be given those. And her being able to help herself saying, what you need to know is that my dad and I are on the same page. So, um, and, and- Oh, that's that, a really great that was, point. Before you go any further, we're on the same page. That trust factor, I think that uh, my husband could attest to this is there are times when they have you in separate rooms and they think it's, like a used car salesman or something where they're like, oh, let your wife wait in the other room while we actually work a deal with the men. This happens in medical care as well. And we've had many situations where my husband put a phone in a nurse's hand uh, my, when I had my first seizure because it was like they were calling around to a bunch of neurologists. He said, no, you're going to call her neurologist. This is his name. This is his phone number. He put the phone in her hand wow. and started dialing. And I think it goes to your point, Dennis, because we talked a lot about um, in our meeting, we talked about the relationship that you're building with these people and where, you know, when you start coming in with your folder and your things and you've told people is that th that lets that person, that starts that relationship. We are going to, we are two people here who are treating this person and it matters to me. And as someone who understands that also doctors don't have it so easy and there's lots of patients who come in for doctor's advice and then don't take it or don't take it seriously, it's difficult for both sides. And I think that, it, I mean, you talked a great deal. I love that you, you're, we gotta get into your uh, relationship, the way that you talk about building relationships in these things and how that functions. Cause I really like some. I'm I'm actually going to steal some of the stuff that your dad does, Julia. This is good stuff. Well, I just yeah, want to add to thank you guys both for sharing. That means a lot to us and I think yeah, the audience. Definitely. But also, um, oh my gosh, what you had to go through just to get her into the Mayo Clinic. Um, I think that, you know, Common Club made a common here of the U.S. health system being overly complicated and a maze of frustration. Um if I didn't have an advocate for me, I don't think I could have done what you did. So, I mean, that's yeah. right. Like there is an overcomplication to this that I think we do need to address a little bit because I don't think just one person can take this on either. Yeah. Well, and that's a point that I made with you all when we were talking about this last night is that although I think especially for daily care and first-time doctor's visits and follow-up doctor's visits locally during more stable times, uh, there's a lot to offer where you can be your own advocate. But in my opinion, 
some of the most important advocacy may be done on your behalf when you are in, in some kind of extreme situation, a manic episode, a depressive episode, um, yeah. somewhere on that continuum, and perhaps least capable of representing yourself. And so the way you do handle self-advocacy under that situation is you anticipate that you know when we're dealing with mental illness and what your mental illness is, that those times will come. And so you put your team together so that when you need them most, they're there and they know what to do and they know the history and hopefully they've been building relationships um, that will help in one way or another. And Julie and I have discussed a couple of stories that I think are pr particularly meaningful that we'll get into at one point or another during this, uh, just, this hour. Just really quick, Dennis, we did do a show um, on, on planning. Somebody remind me of the name of that show. Um, Julia, you know it best. Um, and I think that's a good episode too, where you actually write down your plan. You have your oh, rap your, plan. That was rap plan. plan. Thank you. Oh um, my gosh! So I would definitely cool. reference. Be more <laughs> I would. I would definitely reference that episode as well because I think that leads into you know what you were talking about, Dennis, of really, um, you know, having a plan and, and knowing who your contacts are and things. Like yeah, that. and yeah, I because would... what does advocacy mean to each of you? Like, I think that's an important point because it, you have to establish what it means to yourself first, and then know what you, your goals are to know like what kind of how what you want to rely on yourself for and what you may want to turn over to someone else and who those people should be so what does it mean to each of you Trina you want to go first personally um it means um being an advocate for myself um honestly a lot of it uh being prepared and ready to meet with doctors and knowing what my goals and expectations are um it wasn't until this episode where I was a little bit like wow, um, I haven't sat my husband down and talked about my doctors and my medications and, you know, really important things that like right now, you know, I'm off a of medication and I'm going a little whack. Like he would, he could have known that beforehand. And that's just on me. Like we're sitting here talking about um, mental health and these are the things that you just kind of forget sometimes. I don't know. Not that that's like, it's a really important thing not to forget, though. So don't forget <laughs> to do that. <laughs> That's I think good it's advice. A, it's for me because I have been incapacitated and needed someone to act on my actual physical behalf. Um, I mean, I have a great husband and he's been my caregiver. And I'm very, very fortunate because trust is the biggest thing. I mean, this is someone who is speaking for you when your very life could be at stake. And... You know, I've done a lot for myself, but it wasn't until I got much older and had a relationship with someone who cared about me in that way, where I started to actually reevaluate what I wanted out of my healthcare situation and then had to take hold of it. I actually, um, you know, to, to that point, I do carry a giant medical folder around with my imagery in it and everything. And that does actually set a good, you know, okay, this person is not fooling around and they do care about their health and I appreciate that. And I can usually tell which doctors are cool with that and which ones aren't or which you know therapists or whatever. I find it generally positive. So that's been my experience, fortunately, is that people like that because they like that you're proactive. Um, but I, anytime I'm about to go in either for something or for something I'm concerned about, because I got in the habit of doing this, I write a list of questions. It's something that I've done since I was a kid to make me feel better about having any control about any situation I was going into. But I always have, like, what things do I absolutely need answered? And so when I'm thinking about my, my and someone acting on behalf of my ad advocacy, it's asking and getting answered the questions I know I will need to make me the most effective in taking care of myself and being taken care of, if that makes sense. It's a, a little long-winded, but, you know, writing those things down, I need to look at it. I need to cross the thing off. You know, did I ask him this? Did I ask him that or her? And uh, yeah. that's, I mean, that's really where I am with that. That makes sense. For me, yeah. self-advocacy means independence because, um, 
it's it's a way of speaking for myself is is using my voice to protect my own independence and my own freedoms and even if i need to turn that voice over to someone else to be my voice um, i know that they're going to do everything there in their power to protect my independence as much as possible in whatever degree that may be healthy at that moment um, but to the greatest degree that it can be That's yeah i love that you and you make a great point of like it's really being trusting that other person, right? That being your have voice, the best interest, you know, your best interest at heart. Yeah, and I think you know most people are going to. I hope. Yeah, but it's hard. So, it's hard when you're acting in a situation like what we're talking about. I think that, that we were getting to that point a little bit. Is that because it's so extreme? Mm -hmm. There's a yeah. lot. I think you brought up some good points, Mel, about asking the right questions, asking bringing the questions, the questions that you're not going to leave without getting answered and then asking the right questions. So I think if you want to talk about that, dad, that'd be great. Okay. So what Julie is referring to is a story I shared with her, uh, where I was working for, uh, a woman, a uh, very, very close friend and, uh, acting as her surrogate. And she, um, was a college professor who was stricken in, on her last uh, sabbatical in, uh, in Europe and had to be flown home by air ambulance. I had to fly over, spend six weeks at, uh, at the uh, American hospital in Paris and fly her back by air ambulance and get her into um, facil local facilities and assisted living facilities and whatnot. And then uh, with a world-renowned uh, neurologist because we couldn't figure out what had happened to her. We ended up spending 10 weeks up at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville and uh, came back and was still, uh, everyone was struggling trying to figure out what had happened to her and how to treat it. And so that led us to a therapy called IVIG uh, where uh, she would be getting this, and as it was described to us, uh, she would be getting uh, infusions um, in her assisted living facility. Um, it can be very expensive because it's oftentimes not covered by insurance. And so, but the neurologist, again, a world-renowned uh, neurologist, uh, felt that this was uh, the next step in trying to, uh, trying to find out if IVG, IG therapy uh, would in fact uh, show some improvement. So I uh, referred me to uh, the provider out in California and uh, they would be shipping um, uh, the medicine here and uh, we got into insurance and whether or not it was paid for and what the costs were would be and found out that it would be over $100,000 uh, to get a treatment. And I started asking every question. <laughs> Mel, I like your reaction there. Um, I started asking every question I could think of. Uh, and, and a good part of what I do is figuring out what questions to ask. Um, and uh, and uh, trying to find uh, approaches that that you know where one thing builds on another. Well, anyway, I was striking out um, every way I was asking. Uh, it was you know there was no way to get this. No insurance was covering it, and um, I finally said. And this is a, a fallback position for me. I will usually ask this at least once in this type of meeting where we're, you know, trying to find uh, an alternative is, is there anything I'm not asking? Is there, is there anything that I should have asked that I haven't asked? Or is there any situation you can think of where this would apply that we just haven't talked about yet? She didn't have to bat an eye or swallow or hesitate in any way. She said, well, if this were in a hospital, we could get it done for free. Just like that. If she, if she were hospitalized, we could get it done for free. I said, 
uh, say again. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she said, well, you know, too bad you have to do this as a home infusion therapy. That's where all the problem is. Um, and for whatever reason, I mean, we, we've been at this for 45 minutes and, and she never talked about, well, is there any possibility that she could be hospitalized? And so I said, we can get her hospitalized really easy. I'm quite sure of that. Uh, one call to the neurologist. And, um, and that's what we did. So called like the neurologist. He said, uh, okay, I'm hospitalizing her. She needs this treatment. Did a direct admit. And within a couple of days, she was getting her three-day treatment. Medicare covered everything. This is a problem wow. with our situation. I think that going back to even what Common Club said is that there are so many levels that you almost need a Rosetta Stone to work the uh, medical system here in, in our area. But also what you did, you, what, did, what would you ask if you were in my spot? What, you know, what am I not asking you? I think that, that it's thinking of a different perspective. I think when we are getting into... Um, you know, use the, uh, the apologize first uh, situation where we get a little bit into that in a minute. But the idea that, you know, I might be heated or I might be intense or I might be doing these things or we might be going around in these circles. What is the thing that we can do to bridge that gap? What is that Rosetta Stone? And in that case, that's a great question, too. I uh, use that with little guys when you're working with kids. You do the same thing as like, what are you feeling right now? It's a very mm. similar idea to boiling it way, way, way down to something basic. And uh, I love that. I, I'm using that. that. That's one of the ones that's going right in the file. <laughs> going with me to the doctor next time. You know, I have a great example of that just happening to me. I've been on a medication that is extremely expensive. It's like $1,800 a month. Um, never been able to get it through insurance. Um, you know, through insurance, it's like, let's say $300 or $500. Um, Significantly I less. This, I have this amazing um, person that does the meds for my do doctor, and I was desperate. They were out of the samples that I usually get for this medication, and I was like, what can we do? Like, I will pay out of pocket for this med. I don't care. And it all that's all it took for me to say that I will not pay out of pocket, and now I have it at $15. Like, I have it at my copay. And this drug is, is literally, like, I know other people that are, you know, just taking samples of it because it's so expensive and I now can get it. So I think that is a great, great thing. Yeah. Asking the right question. Yeah. That's all it takes sometimes <laughs> after years. And sometimes you won't know what the right question is, um, which is why we, we say that. And so you have to attack it when we're dealing with our healthcare system, you have to attack it from so many different angles. So there were therapies that we knew were successful and we were even being advised to consider at Mayo Clinic. Now this is not for Julia, but this was for this college professor that I'm talking about. And yet they would not, uh, they would not, provide those therapies. And what you have to explore is why. Is it because insurance won't cover it and you think we won't pay for it? Um, is it because insurance will cover it uh, but will balance bill um, and, and it's still too expensive? Is it because it's an experimental therapy even though there's good data and research behind it? And for, you know, the world's best health institution in the Mayo Clinic, um, they all have reputations to uphold. So even though they may recommend it, they themselves may not be able to, to provide it based on their own protocols and what they have to do to both establish and protect their credentials and their, uh, their institution. And so... I ended up getting things, finding from them what we should consider, even though we weren't able to get it there. We have to, so ironically, we go to one of the world's best institutions 
find out what might work and also find out that they can't do it. Then you go to a much lesser, just a local doctor who is willing to prescribe that. I think a lot uh, of it has to do with Dennis, how you approach the situation. And we talked a bunch about your approach to situations and how you treat the people that you're interacting with when you are advocating versus the ways we could act versus sort of how you act. And I maybe talk a little bit about um, some of the ways you got things done. I thought that uh, you were very, you know, uh, you, how things just turned on a dime sort of because you had established a relationship and because of the way that you approached the situation. And yes. I think that people need to understand that approach does go, it's the next step from the clipboard is, is that interacting with human beings portion right. of it. Right. Well, and, and oftentimes a lot of this is done by phone. So we're not in front of the person that we're talking to we can't judge their facial reactions or their postures or their body language. Um, and, and this may be someone that, as we were talking about right before we went on air, um, who gets beat up every day over the phone uh, because they have a lot more negative uh, to say than positive, at least as it's interpreted by the people who are wanting some immediate answer or solution. And so, what their policies are and their credentials, like you were just talking about, all right. of those things that are before them that they have to worry about. Right. So when I start off, it may be with an insurance claims adjuster. And, and here's one story as it applies to, to Julia. Um, so we had an insurance claims adjuster who was just terrific, uh, but it started off um, uh, with me the way I normally do. So uh, the, my habit is to begin a relationship by apologizing. And that's why uh, one of the bullet points is start apologizing or always apo start apologizing. Um, and what I apologize for is that I'm working on behalf of my daughter uh, trying to get her uh, the best care imaginable as soon as possible, um, in every way possible. And um, when I'm first talking to someone, they may be telling me, and, and Julia may be in what we're interpreting as a crisis, uh, where she's either in a manic episode or a depressive episode. And, and um, what we know is that whatever has been working isn't working and she needs some additional help and we're trying to schedule an appointment and all of a sudden you're hearing uh, in this first time phone call that uh, the appointment, uh, the first appointment available is three months uh, away. And you could get very upset about that and say, wait a minute, didn't you hear that this was an emergency? <laughs> um, and, uh, and whatever that situation is that they're working through with you, very quickly I can become impassioned and if I'm not careful, I can get loud. Um, I grew up speaking loud to a parent who was, who was uh, mostly deaf and, and so I speak loud anyway and then when I get upset I can speak much louder. And so I try to create expectations from the start and let them know how I view them, which is as a partner, actually they are my liaison. They are my contact to the whole company at this point, if it's uh, this insurance claims manager. And um, they need to know that, so, so I explain to them, look, uh, I'm, I'm going to start off apologizing because as you'll soon find out, I'm really working hard to help my daughter. And um, if I'm hearing things like there's going to be significant delays or whatever, it can be very upsetting. And I'm telling you, frankly, when I get upset, I can get loud and I need you to know I'm not attacking you. I see you as the partner. You're the person I'm asking for help with. And um, I'm hoping 
that you understand that. And, and uh, please let me know. Don't hesitate to interrupt me and say, hey, I think you're getting loud or whatever. And so frequently I might get start getting loud and I apologize again. And when I know that I've really connected and we've got a relationship where they're thinking about not just me, but they're really focused on my daughter is when I get loud and I apologize again and they say, oh, don't, you don't have to apologize. Don't, don't worry. You don't have to apologize. I know you're doing this for your daughter. And when they say that, I know that I've got a partner and she's doing things for my daughter too. And, and if I get loud, it actually, she, she it, it's not an offensive thing. She's kind of rallying to the cause. And the way that resulted in, in, with this, that kind of relationship worked up where Julia ended up going through a, um, uh, a residential facility and then uh, a partial hospitalization and then uh, therapy, outpatient therapy uh, several times a week. But as most insurance companies do, you know, they're trying to approve these a couple of appointments at a time. And great, um, great comment from Joseph just to jump in by yeah. starting off apologizing. People, I imagine, drop their guard. Yes, I think you're exactly mm -hmm. right. Oh, I didn't I, this see one that. hit me the most. I think that oh, that's we, okay. you know, we had talked about this a little bit last night. We do pre-show, pre-show. Um, and it hit me because I get heated a lot, I feel like, in my, in my journey with uh, doctors and uh, even sometimes, you know, with the pharmacists. Um, I, Just I hate front to of house that, people it, it, doing their job. Dennis, when you said that, it really made me, like, check myself a little bit and think, like, wow, like, I'm – causing a worse situation and I realize I might be manic or I might be depressed but like I'm causing a worse situation the other person is just a human I'm just a human we can get through this together I don't need to be loud and it really just made me check myself so that would really yeah hard. I think that um that uh this type of approach doesn't have to be you don't have to be talking about your daughter you can be talking about yourself and just like exactly. whatever your situation is at home like you know I apologize in advance if I get loud you know, I just really care about my health. I have a, a family at home and I just really like, I'm all that they have and I really yeah. care about them. Or I have two dogs at home or I have a kid at home. Whatever you have, whatever is, is whatever your situation is, this can be applied to. Um, and just sort of that, uh, that approach of starting off apologizing and then, um, and then, you know, making a partner out of someone who I might be an, an enemy otherwise. Yeah. I'd love to give you guys my um, version of it because I have used this and I did appreciate that I wasn't alone in that. I mean, sometimes it's like I'm the only one out there sort of acting this way. Oh no, there are other people also advocating in similar ways. It's very reassuring. When I heard Dennis's stories for me, it was like, yes, advocacy, like I'm doing it right. And I um, oftentimes what I would tell people is I've worked really hard to be here and to be healthy um, I spent, you know, several months in the hospital and, and faced those things. So for me, it's like, no, I, I'm just very serious about my health. And it is something that and I think it's important that we have the balance because Dennis did make the point also is that that person may be in crisis, Katrina, day by day, because we know the nature of mental health. We know that we may be in a bad situation and the wherewithal to check ourselves is something that just comes with practice doing these things over and over and also understanding that these are the things that have to be done and that's why i'm really glad that we're doing this episode tonight is understanding what those things are to do and hopefully giving people ideas i mean hopefully when people walk away from here they have a list of things that they can use to self-advocate i mean because that's the entire reason that we started exactly that's why we're start doing start with show. the rap plan start with the rap plan. yeah that wrap up yeah. was a lot of fun and and Joseph, really fast, totally agree. Um, Shows you're passionate for the cause. Yes. Yeah. Yep, yep. Amen, right. brother. And I think that that's, we all do have to be our own advocate. We've said that many times leading up to this very episode, and that's why. So. And it um, also takes a village in some ways. Right? That's right. It takes family, it takes friends, it takes whoever you can trust to kind of grapple with. While we're on this subject and we're talking about developing that relationship, could you talk a little bit about how that trust goes both ways and, and what trust can mean to this relation, this burgeoning relationship? Right. In fact, the, the trust starts with that apology and, and, and people seeing uh, so many times they're treated 
like they are the gatekeeper or they're the obstacle that has to be run over to get. So if they're not giving you the right answer, you're demanding to speak to their supervisor and blah, 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 blah. And, and everything just escalates from there in a very sometimes ugly way. And if instead you're apologizing, you're showing your passion, you're admitting, like, I like what Julia said, you know, I'm a mother, my kids depend on me. That's they great. find it very frightening if I'm in crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, you know, I, I, I'm doing all I can. Um, you're developing a trusting relationship. And... I am a firm believer that it goes both ways and, and Julia can tell you story after story of the positive outcomes we've gotten that we could not have predicted. Some things occurring from because I had a relationship with someone several years earlier, I was able to call on them or because they knew that I'd never misrepresented and so this is part about trust going both ways. It's very easy if someone is desperate for help to uh, maybe be very selective in what they're sharing or talking about. And, um, and what I have always worked to do is share, uh, be rigorously honest about whatever the situation is um, and so when I'm speaking about uh, insurance claims or a disability claim, um, if, if you are totally honest and they sense that you're totally honest, at the same time you're, you're trying to get the best possible outcome, there oftentimes comes a time, no matter how much of this seems to be so bureaucratic and paperwork, and it's all run by paperwork and we just check off the boxes. In the end, you have the opportunity to make their job easier by, because there will come a time when they know they can check you off or answer a question or approve something and move your file off their desk and go to the next one. And if you remember that, Great things can happen. Julia is one of the few people, in fact, I think she posted this on Instagram, where in, in many of her, um, her residential and, uh, or in, in one or, or more of her residential and, and partial hospitalizations, uh, everyone was applying for disability. Julia was the only one who got it. And after getting it, it had to be approved for literally month in month out for a total of two years well i began working with that claims manager in 2016 and she denied me the first time and i expected to be denied but what and i had a long talk with julia about this at the time is i was submitting the claim deliberately knowing it was going to be denied in order to have a discussion with her about what would a claim have to look like that wasn't denied, okay? Yeah. And so I was soliciting that information from her before I was actually submitting the claim that I knew I would eventually have to submit. But I was very respectful and of her, she was respectful of me, and she proved herself to be incredibly authoritative and kind and caring as well. And I had no doubts that she was gonna be, and she was a senior claims manager. That was in 2016. In 2018, I submit a claim, actually at the end of 2000, uh, August of 2018. And um, we go through the first year and did a lot of the documentation. She shortcutted some of it. But at the end of the year, she give, gives me a call and says, um, so where, where do we stand? And, um, I, and that was in August of 2019. And Julia's claim would go through August of, two, of 2020. It just ended. And I told her... Um, Julia's been in therapy twice a week, 
and there hasn't even been a discussion about her going back to work yet. Her answer was, okay, we'll revisit this uh, in January. Okay. That was an immediate answer. There was no follow up with either her therapist or her psychiatrist. Boom, done, off her desk. We'll, we'll make a call in January. January 2nd or 3rd, she calls me and says, where are we now? I said, Julia's been through a recent crisis there and the psychiatrist that we believe handled it well. Um, her medication has been changed though. So there's no possibility that she's going back to work for a while. We need to see if this is working, but we also have good news. We're going to the Mayo Clinic at the end of the month. Great, I'll call you in March. Again, no documentation whatsoever. But this was because Wait, of what you had built, wow. the relationship that you'd already built with her in those, in those prior years. Exactly. You built this relationship and built this trust up that she had trusted him enough at this point that she could just say, okay, that's fine. I take your word for it. I don't need anyone else's word. So it didn't word. go back to the doctors, didn't go back to the therapist. I mean, that's no. kind of unheard of. Well, she yeah. trusted that you value that wow. relationship too. And I think that that's the bigger issue here. I think that um, I've had some great outcomes for this. I, I had my neurologist assistant's phone number. We had her number. She gave it to us one day and said, if you have any more of these problems you had had up to being with them and getting to the correct neurological institute to take care of my problems, I, I still have her number programmed in my phone and I never actually caught her last name till much, much later, because I only knew her as Davida. That was how I knew her. She was the head neurosurgeon and head of neurology at the Neurological Institute's assistant. And that just came strictly from exactly the kinds of stuff that you're talking about, is that knowing that we aren't messing with her and making her day harder either, that we both legitimately are invested in what the treatment is and who it's going to and what that relationship looks like. And we're not going to make you look bad. You're not going to do anything that's not transparent with us being human to each other. I think that that's a really, really big thing that we need to remember is that it's super simple to just remember that you're talking to another human being theoretically. But in reality, when you're sitting there, it's really, like you said, obstacle gatekeeper person I need to run through when you're in a crisis or your loved one's in a crisis, it's very easy for your brain to just simply sort of like go into fight or flight mode, go into protection mode. And I, that, that ability, I think, um, disability is a whole other show. I have a friend who's also recently been applying for it and it takes years and it's very difficult. And you do, you must go into applying with disability or disability with the expectation you're going to get denied because that is, I'm here to tell everyone when you apply, you're going to get denied, stick with it because that's part of the process they are going to put you through. And that's why that's like that. And get to know, like Dennis talked about, get to know someone, get a name. Yeah, get definitely get a name. Get Another thing person. is um, keeping a record of everyone that you speak with. I think that you yeah. said that that was important to add to some is um, keeping a record of every single person that you talk with because you don't know when that's going to pay off. Yeah. And in fact that, and it did pay off. So you have your name person, uh, first name person. I have one uh, whose name is Evelyn. Um, let me just wrap up uh, the, the trust part of this though is what I do know and what everyone should know is that you're make you're helping them to make their job easier and they're approving something on the spot but you always know that because you've been completely honest that should they need to document something should they need to just put in a request to the doctor for uh verification that she's seen her psychiatrist every two months or whatever that part of the trust is if she requests that she's going to find out exactly what i've told her and uh, but she approved it before she ever got that and i've already confirmed that in fact we got the whole second year uh of disability approved on three phone calls so 
Uh, the Evelyn phone call was interesting because that that's a disability again related to mental illness and 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 therapy and recovery uh, time, and uh, the state of California. Oh, that's the other thing I wanted to bring up is um in recovery we talk about rigorous honesty a lot too. I just thought that was interesting when you brought that up because in recovery we're always talking about being rigorously honest, and I think that it comes it all comes back to healing, right? And it comes yes. back to what you're doing to heal and you're, you're healing through developing these relationships and you're healing through the work that, you know, I'm healing through my work I'm doing as a patient. Um, and, and we're all healing together. Yes, yes. So this is Disability, the state of California, which has a wonderful uh, program. Um, and uh, after Julia had moved back here, but she was still getting uh, disability from the state for the first year. And they had uh, sent something saying that they needed uh, a new uh, documentation from the doctor. Uh, then they sent something else that seemed to contradict that. And then we got a denial saying that the claim had terminated because we hadn't gotten something back in time. And um, I ended up flying out there with Julia. We, we, uh, had some other things on our plate that we could uh, go out and enjoy. Uh, but, but I let them know that I was flying out to appeal the termination of her benefits. And so I went to the downtown office and, um, uh, explained the situation, showed the documentation. I had everything in a file, everything chronologically arranged, blah, 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 blah. And I got a very polite no. Uh, sorry. And, um, and this was at the end, this, at this time, it was about five o'clock. We'd flown out that morning. I spent about three hours waiting at the office, went from the airport directly to the office. It was about five minutes to five. Um, and I was getting turned down and they closed uh, at five. And, and this is an office that walks out at five o'clock. And, I checked my phone because I'd been making phone calls to someone who had uh, been in that office two years earlier and had given me her cell phone and said, look, if you ever need help, call me on this cell uh, or this back line. It's a, it's a line that we use. And I had called and left numerous messages, never got any of them answered, but I had her name, Evelyn. And so um, I said to the guy, um, it, does Evelyn still work here? And he looks up at me and he was looking down at the paperwork. And he just looked up at me like he, he was guilty. And it's like, why are you asking about Evelyn? And I said, um, because I have her phone number, I've left a couple of messages and I haven't gotten them answered. I have a feeling that she might have a new phone number or maybe she doesn't even work here. Does she still work here? He says, she's my boss. She runs the whole department. <laughs> And I said, oh, great. Can I see her? Can I talk with her? And he said, uh, well, she's in the middle of something right now. We're about to close. Um, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll check. It's, and again, I think he was even willing to check and to confirm all that with me, because even though he was denying me, we were having a very pleasant conversation. Um, he comes back just a couple minutes later and says, Evelyn says that if you said you didn't get it, you didn't get it, and we need to reinstate. That simple. She was too busy to come out, but she said yeah, it she was didn't reinstated. Even come out and talk to me. But she reinstated it just From like that. From two years earlier. Wow. And you never know. So keep a, a list of every person that you speak with and what you spoke about because you and never treat them all know like humans. When you're yeah. going to need to refer to someone's name who you spoke with three years before. I think it says something about Dennis that she remembered him from all that time ago. They deal with a lot of people on a daily basis. They remember the people that treat them like people also. And I think that that matters. You made an impact on her somehow. Yeah. And you don't know. I mean, two years is a long time in any profession where you're doing the kinds of things and seeing the numbers of people, especially in medical health, because they're just as busy as the rest of us, if not more, just inundated with paperwork. That's 
that says everything about making these relationships with people, making sure that, because, and you said it, it's genuine. You weren't just putting that out there to be some kind, you weren't being a shill, you weren't faking it. You literally care about your daughter and you care about the circumstances. And that resonates with people because they have people they care about. And I just, the being yourself and being real and being transparent, those things, rigorously honest. I love that, that terminology. I, it's perfect because it's easy to remember the truth. I mean, it's just the easiest thing to remember. Yes, yeah, Dennis is looks, a legend. Dennis is a legend. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> I think we need a Dennis like an advocate legend. guide, Dennis advocate guide to mental health. Yeah, you like, might need to. Yeah, uh, that you might need to write a book. Um, because there's also like a lot of um, you know, I I started out my career in sales and there's a lot of like salesy things to the the things that we're talking about um but like in a good way um because usually people don't you know put the two together but um yeah there's a lot of good tactics you can kind of use um if you have a sales background or you know anything about sales it really especially with the clipboard and um you know being trustworthy and just like answer asking the right questions that's always so important I love it. But the best sales yeah. you've ever done, Katrina, I bet you, you were doing them because you believed in the product that you were selling oh, and were totally. being genuine with the, <laughs> but wait, I think that to a degree, I think it's funny that you bring that up because, you know, most of my family is in, in sales, including my husband. So, and that's like a, the history of, and when I was even doing work with kids and mentoring and contracts, I used a lot of their sales background because they were actually transparent salespeople that exists folks i'm here to tell it's, it's, it's well, and there's like some really good things you learn if you're in yes. sales like being able to um ask the right question is i think like one of the well top that's huge things, you know? <laughs> yes so um understanding your audience is so important yeah, yeah definitely i think there's those are just skills. skills i don't know if they're sales skills i think they're just skills it's just skills <laughs> right well, and, and this is something I've shared with Julia before, um, which is never have just one goal in mind. Yeah. And so yeah. when, you know, so again, you can go off on a tent or, or you can get upset or, uh, and, and these people that we're talking to oftentimes are, you know, viewed as obstacles and whatnot. If the only thing you're trying to do is get the appointment <laughs> or get whatever you're calling specifically about. But if you have multiple goals in mind, uh, you never know when one piece of information might pan out. Just like when I applied for disability, knowing that I was going to get denied, I wanted to get into a conversation about why I was being denied so that I could get a very good picture of what a successful claim would look like, what she would need to be looking at. And um, when I was talking, for instance, uh, with uh, the uh, representatives with uh, Julia's kind of liaison at a place where she was doing some partial hospitalization therapy and then outpatient therapy um, at a um, clinic in Pasadena, um, uh, I was asking some specific questions um, about the, the, uh, to the nurse about a different medication that they were uh, suggesting that Julia use. I was getting very, very specific. And he said, uh, you know what? Our medical director here is really an expert in this particular medicine. Would you like to talk with her? Yes. So we had a delightful talk. And, um, uh, you know, it wasn't, it, 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 it was something that, uh, we could have had or not had, and Julia would have ended up with the same result, but I had now a relationship with the medical director. Now, fast forward a year and a half and Julia is hospitalized and she's in California and I'm in Florida. And they, the, she did not choose the hospital that she was sent to. And they didn't know her from Adam. And they didn't know me. 
So no relationships were in play. And this is where self-advocacy me means that you, you have to have your team set up to handle special crisis situations. So I knew that she was going to be discharged and she was going to be discharged to a facility of their choosing. Usually the facility of their choosing is the one most convenient um, that has an opening. And most of the places that have openings, you don't want to send your loved ones to. Exactly. And so, and we were on a time crunch. They were going to discharge her within 24 hours and I needed to get control of the situation. So I immediately am faxing out my power of attorney, healthcare surrogate paperwork, and they're sending it to their legal team. Well, Julia could have been shipped off before their legal team ever got back. And so before they were even accepting my power of attorney paperwork, I made a call to the medical director whom I talked to a year and a half earlier and said, can you call this hospital and tell them that you'll accept her? And she did. And so within a half an hour, um, they, I had turned everything completely around and they were accepting my power of attorney because it had been confirmed through the medical director. And, and even though it was still with their legal department, all the doctors were responding to me as power of attorney and they would never have sent her there because it was over 20, 25 miles away. I asked them and they wouldn't have sent their ambulance. So I got the medical director to send their ambulance. They drove 25 miles to pick up Julia and then drive 25 miles uh, back. All of that happened while I was in Florida and she was, and by the time that she was being pulled up to that Pasadena facility, her mom had, had landed and was pulling up and was greeting Julia there. So that all happened as a result of a half an hour talk I had with the medical director a year and a half earlier. But I had to, to know too that here's one person who might be able to make everything happen with a single phone call. And it did. Yeah, and I think that's a great point for everyone listening is if you suffer from mental, if you deal with mental health issues at all, you know, it might be a great thing to consider having a power of attorney or um, some sort of surrogate named legally so that um, you don't get into sticky situations when you're incapacitated and you can't advocate for yourself. So part of advocating for yourself is doing this in advance and having this paperwork laid out by an attorney so that it's legally sound. Get a dentist in your life. Yeah, get a dentist. Thank you, Joseph. Find one. I mean, I, I mean, I have a lot of this stuff and a lot of this wording is familiar to me, but I think a lot of people are unfamiliar with the concept of, you know, power of attorney and the, the living will situations and all of these things that go on where if you are incapacitated due to any number of crises, you are going to, this, this person is your voice. And I mean, my dentist is called Bob and uh, he, he does a lot of these things. And I, I hear a lot of very similar stories. It's very much about the person that you are talking about being, which is that you are going in there and nothing is, you're just being yourself. You're being your, you're being a dad, you're being a human, you're being all of these things. So it's not that difficult when you, at the end of the day are just, you're talking to somebody about somebody you love. And that's, I think when you're the person that needs an advocate, find the person that you know loves you next to you, that, you know, the person that's holding you up. Maybe it's a husband, maybe it's a sibling, maybe it's one of those things, but don't be afraid to do that. And uh, make sure you're having those conversations. I think Julia's spoken in the past about, we did do the rep episode. She did say, you know, make sure you're having these conversations because you might need someone to be in charge of these things. I, this yeah, is yeah. this is the reason yeah. why and these great conversations and any mean, of us can do this any of us yeah. can step up and be this person for someone else or for her 
for ourselves. But look at Joseph's comment. I love that. Remember to smash that like button, everyone. This is a fantastic episode. What a great comment. Thanks, Joseph. Thanks for tuning Thank you, in. Joseph. And great. everyone listen to Joseph yeah. and remember to smash that like button. <laughs> or you can tap it lightly. You don't have to get excited. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can tap, tap, tap. Exactly. And I just want to reiterate again, um, we have an episode called Rap, W-R-A-P. I think that is a great place to start um, for self-advocacy. And, um, you know, check it out or just Google it. It's called Let's Talk About Rap, baby. Because Let's Katrina talk about rap, baby. baby. So it should be easy baby. to find. Let's talk about you yes. and me. <laughs> um, Dennis, good. thank you so much. Um, well, I think there's one more thing we wanted to more? cover. Oh, okay. um, uh, writing, to wrap up everything, writing a rave review. This is another oh, way that you yeah. can help, well, that help is people a good help point. you. That's really important. Yeah. Okay. And, and so uh, most of the time, in fact, probably every time, uh, it just, the timing is different in the relationship. Um, but I always make a point of when I'm talking with someone and if they've gone, it, it's clear that they have gone out of their way. Um, I let them know how grateful I am, how thankful I am. And by the way, is there anything I can do for you to recognize this? Uh, you know, uh, what I understand is that you have gone above and beyond your job description here. And, and then I specifically ask, and I usually let them know with a little bit of humor, you know, I can write a great rave review. And they go, would you do that? Usually they're taken back that they're not having to ask me for something like that, or they're not getting a survey sent to me from their boss. But I'm saying, can I write a review? And who, who could I send that to? And I get their contact information and then, and then I write that rave review and it is a rave review and it's a lengthy, it's always a lengthy rave review. And, uh, but again, rigorously honest, going into description of everything that they did above and beyond and how grateful we are and, and the positive things that have happened because of that. And um, we wouldn't hesitate to recommend her and this company and so on and so forth. And, um, and I copy them in too, not blind copy, but I copy them in so that it goes to their supervisor and the supervisor knows that they have gotten it. Cause I don't know if that supervisor is a good person or not. Would they share, would they, you know, would they hold back? Mm -hmm. um, so I want them to know you know, that, oh, Damn. this person you were working with knows that this supervisor got this review. And so they end up talking about it. And in fact, oftentimes I get uh, an answer from the supervisor that then copies in that person as well. So, and, and, and that's a feel good thing. You feel like nice. you've given back. And the response is very immensely positive, right? I I did this recently for my pharmacist because he and his staff have gone so above and beyond for my husband and I for such a long time. And they are constantly just getting crushed in there. So I wrote them a review about all of these things and use their names and let the people know. And, and, and I know that he was able to get it because I didn't have his direct information, but he actually thanked us when we came in and it was like, no, thank you. And I mean, it's, it's pretty, I know I keep saying that it's easy to do this, but the more you have these experiences, when you start to have these relationships with people, the, it'll get a little easier every time. That's so yeah. funny you said that, Mel, because my pharmacist knows me by name, um, or not the pharmacist, the, the assistant pharmacist, Yeah. and it shocks me. Like, everybody's like, hi, Katrina. I'm like, oh my God, how do you know me? And I just wrote her a review as well, because I'm just shocked that every time she knows my name, like, that's all it took. That, you know, that little bit of of her recognizing me felt good. And they don't hear it. It's just like any, yeah. I think we've all worked in jobs where we don't get the positive feedback. And that's very much yeah. where I put my headspace when it comes to this sort of thing is I know these people, especially in this profession, don't hear the positive that much. Doing that will get a call from the medical director a year and a half to get you better. I mean, it's exactly in a natural way. Yeah, and it doesn't go unnoticed. 
It Good. means something. It really means something. These people yeah. and they'll. And I mean, the, the response afterwards that we've gotten afterwards is like very genuine and heartfelt. That it really meant something to them. Well, they're going to remember you. They're going to remember you, and that's yeah. going to build that relationship further, exactly. so that you can continue to have these positive experiences down the road as as you consider liaison, continue liaison with each other. Have you guys ever had the experience where you were having a good conversation like that next to somebody that had just walked in and maybe seemed a little stressed out and they calmed down as a result of that relationship and actually spoke to the person more calmly as well? You can influence the behavior around you by the way that you behave. Yeah. I've noticed a few times now in talking to those pharmacy people where you'll have the angry person who was waiting just a little too long in their opinion will suddenly calm down and be very cordial to that person. And it creates an environment. And I think that that you can't control people's behavior, but you can control yours. And when you're having those interactions with people in front of others, that spills over too. And I think that that's the only way we're going to start to see a better medical system for everybody is if we all start behaving in a way that we're showing the people in charge, as it were, of the money no, we care about each other and want to do what's right. Our patients want to do what's right. The healthcare providers want to do what's right. I think that you get this disconnect of people not wanting to Heal do together. what's right. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. What were if you going to say, Dad? Wrap up, if I can wrap up one thing and, and just kind say? of pick up and, and uh, emphasize what Julia said about uh, these extreme circumstances where you may be incapacitated and you do need to have the legal paperwork in order and encourage people to to do that the other side of uh, because you you have no legal standing if that isn't done and so if you are incapacitated and hospitalized you don't know if there's anyone speaking for you or not you're kind of closed off and part of what i believe has allowed julia to come out of those situations and she's always handled them really well. And I think part of the reason is because she knows that I'm there working on her behalf. And even if it's a day before she gets to talk to me, she knows I am going to get through to her and them. And I'm going to know everything that's going on. And her chart, her, my power of attorney is going to be on her chart so that anyone who picks up a phone call when I call knows that I'm power of attorney and that I have the right to speak to her. And that allows you to go through some of those very difficult times in a hospital, trusting absolutely that you're going to come out okay because you've got someone who's rock solid working for you. So I just and I and I applaud Julia I because she has never wavered in that she's been she's been this is where trust goes both ways again she totally trusts that even if she doesn't have control in that moment that I am exercising control and it, for her benefit and that allows her to be calm and to accept the treatment and to kind of go through the process. Yeah. Well, thank you for all your help through the years. I really appreciate it. I will say it publicly here. Thank you. <laughs> I tell you privately all the time, but thank you here from the mountaintops. Oh, it's, uh, it's, on the record it's my, now. my privilege and honor. Mm -hmm. I love I you. Well, thanks for all the great advice that you shared with us tonight. Yes, I think thank we all, you. We all need a dentist, so Dennis, get on that book so we can. Yeah, seriously. Uh, oh boy, we'll plug it for you. It. But hopefully, yeah. everyone trusts that th these are things that you can do for yourself as well. Absolutely. Um, because these totally are things that you can control in your own life, and that you can help maintain your own independence by doing actively. And you can start with the wrap plan. It's <laughs> yes. Because I do like that. That is really good. That really does go to the heart of what we're talking about here because it literally is a written plan. And I think that that if you don't have a dentist right this minute, it will be a huge foundation for you and it will make you feel better. I love that point about being calm as I have a similar situation, but it does help to know that if all else fails, here's my plan. And that having that plan is a big thing.
Really, thank you so much for coming on tonight, yes, Dennis. It's been oh, amazing. This, this has been, a great call, uh, Katrina. This has been very special. Thank you all. Um, like, special subscribe. We'll be back next week. And I don't know if you saw in the comments, we will be having uh, how to get through this election episode at some point. So stay tuned for that, too. Coming all soon. All right, guys. Thanks for see watching, everyone. Have a great Bye. night. We'll see you next Tuesday night at 8. Good night, everyone. Stay safe out there.